Welcome to the Lover's Hole, the Patrick O'Brien podcast. We are rereading the Aubrey Matron novels of the great Patrick O'Brien and Mike. Tell us just how far we've got with Letter of Mark and just what might be left for us to uncover this week. You betcha, and happy to do that. So last week, we had started Chapter 9. Ian, you were sitting in Sweden as Stephen came into Stockholm. You were right outside Stockholm. Now, Stephen was buying laudanum and cocoa leaves, and he met Diana on a narrow country road. She explained her relationship with Yagyello and introduced Stephen to her beautiful Arabian mare. Stephen asked her forgiveness. She forgave him, but she said that she'd never put herself in another man's power again, thus effectively turning down his attempt to get back together. Stephen told her about his ominous balloon dream and returned the blue Peter to her. Now, under the influence of a double dose of full-strength laudanum, Stephen fell down the middle of a tall tower, one that he and Diana had climbed up to look at Diana's balloon. And that's where we left off last week. Mm -hmm. So this week, Ian is still in Sweden. I am. It's true. (laughs) And we're going to ride with Stephen and Diana in a long, unexpected and harrowing balloon ride. Stephen is going to receive sage counsel from one of Sweden's best physicians. We dip into Irish mythology, learn a little bit more about Diana's character, and finally join in singing along to Patrick O'Brien's surprise, The Musical. And we get to sit down with our very special guest, illustrator, artist, and O'Brien cover art fan favorite, Jeff Hunt. Oh, it's going to be great. We're really looking forward to this episode. And of course, it's a special time of year as well. This episode comes to you today with all of our best wishes to you, our listeners, and to our Patreon supporters as well. We really hope that as you're listening today, you're enjoying a peaceful holiday season, that you're with your families and you're safe and well, and perhaps enjoying a glass of something from the bottle with the yellow seal. Merry Christmas. Anyhow, Mike, here we are second half of the chapter and we're right in with Stephen. We don't know quite where we are and how we are, but we're right in with Stephen and Diana. The text says, it seemed that in spite of obscure delays and disturbances, the ascent had been postponed rather than cancelled. We're talking about this balloon ascent. At least, if it had been a public performance at all, it must have been on a very modest scale since he could remember no crowd no noise. He did have confused memories of a tumble, of indeterminate injuries and fuss, which muffled the immediate past, and now they had risen above the clouds. A fairly apt parallel for his passing fogginess of mind. And now they were in the pure upper air, with that strangely familiar dark blue above, and on either hand, unless he looked over the edge of the car and down to the fantastic convolutions and the slowly changing geography of the cloud world below, all much purer and more intense, even than his dream, which he remembered perfectly. And Mike, this is this is very beautiful writing, um, but he's very, very cleverly leaving us really unsure as to whether... We're with Stephen recalling and seeing and experiencing real time or whether we're with Stephen in a dream. But we'll we'll keep coming back to that. Stephen notices now that colours are even more miraculous than in his dream. Ah, so we are experiencing reality. We have the basket, we have the ropes, all and an infinity of shades and subtlety. It was as though he had never seen rope before or as though he had recovered his sight after many years of blindness, and when he looked across at Diana, the perfection of her cheek fairly caught his breath. She was sitting there in a green riding habit, with her hands folded in her lap. She was looking down at her diamond, and her eyes were almost closed, the long lashes hiding them. Ha, Mike, I'm still not convinced that we're not in dreamland here. I'll tell you, I I was... I was really thrown off <laughs> turning yeah. the page to this chapter and going, wait, wait, wait. 
it's, you know, Stephen just had this big tumble. What is going on? But as you say, we're, you know, we're going right along. We've got this great description. O'Brien even comes back to how silent the world is and how silent the two of them are. And, and Stephen being conscious that, you know, actually they're, you know, they're so in tune in this silence that no amount of talking would even put them more in tune. And Stephen is wondering if if it's being up this high that's giving him this keener sense of life. He he remembers climbing up the Maladetta, this uh, you know the highest that he had ever gone before, and you know his impressions then of the flora, the fauna, the wildlife. But he's thinking, you know, there's just so much clarity here in the balloon. Now on the mountain, he'd been keenly aware of time. You know, he wanted to make sure he got down before it got dark. But here there is no time or at least no sense of the duration of time. He didn't know whether they'd been floating for hours or for days. And although the mountain had been physically dangerous, O'Brien writes, it had nothing of the indefinable threat present in this immensity. So we're, you know, we're back to this great kind of ominous, you know, you can kind of hear the score with the music kind of darkening and, yeah. and getting us a little on edge. And and Stephen notices that Diana has dozed off and he looks up at the sun's double halo and two prismatic sun dogs before closing his eyes and dropping off himself. Hmm. And Mike, the, so, again, we, we, we're being played with here. It really seems like a realistic description of something that Stephen is seeing in real time. Um, a prismatic sun dog is a very, very specific thing, right? It's a, uh, a, a parhelion, a plural parhelion. It's a bright spot on either side of the sun. Um, when there are ice crystals in the atmosphere, you often see these two little bright spots either side of the sun with a 22 degree halo around them. So uh, there are phenomenon like rainbows in that they're to do with reflection and re- reflection and refraction of light. But rainbows appear at the end of rain. Sun dogs usually portend coming snow or coming freezing rain. And neither of those would be good news in a balloon, right? Right. So we, we, we get further into the realm of, hang on a second, where are we really? At the very beginning of his dream, he could say, I am dreaming but his perception of it faded almost at once, and he was filled with as much anxiety as he would have been if he'd never had a hint of this being only the disturbance of a sleeping mind. So O'Brien finally, finally lets us in on you know, what we've been wondering about all along here. So it is, Stephen. It is a dream. Um, and back into the dream now, Stephen is thinking, you know, okay, it's clear that they'd set off for Spitzbergen. I did wonder for a minute if Patrick O'Brien knew just how far Spitsbergen was from right. Stockholm. But, but well, anyhow, it's, it's a heck of a long way. <laughs> well, that's what I'm thinking. You know, this, this is, you know, Spitsbergen is this very large island far north of Norway, actually. You know, so that's right. So a ways from Stockholm and, and right on the Arctic Circle. And was at the time, and, you know, for some time thereafter, a very big whaling ground. So, you know, Stephen's yeah. thinking, you know, we were setting off to join the whalers and to view the wonders of the Arctic so well described by Mulgrave. But he remembers there'd been a disagreement. And now, instead of floating over a rocky landscape where he expects them to be, there's nothing but gray ocean in sight. Probably, again, adding to this, all right, we're getting way, way, way far north. There's nothing but ocean, a little bit of this ominous feeling. And then, of course, Patrick O'Brien throwing in this Mulgrave. Mulgrave. Ian, any thoughts? Mulgrave? <laughs> well, while Stephen is floating in a fanciful imaginary balloon, we get to go down a, down a mine, down a rabbit hole again. Um, it turns out that Mulgrave, surprise, surprise, was a real person. Um, second Baron Mulgrave, known to his friends as Constantine John Phipps, fellow of the Royal Society, was alive in the late 18th century, an English explorer and Royal Navy officer. Uh, he was dispatched in 1773 to see how far navigation was practicable towards the North Pole, looking for another route to the east to India, and was charged with making, um, as his order said, such observations of every kind as might be useful to navigation or tend to the promotion of natural knowledge. This fellow, Mulgrave, was the first modern European to describe the polar bear and the ivory gull. And Mike, there's a, there's a really nice little connection here. Um, Jack 
living a few decades later, would have been delighted to know that one of Mulgrave's two ships, the Carcass, had a midshipman aboard by the name of Horatio Nelson. Right. And we may we may hear that Horatio Nelson name again in our interview. Yeah, we might. We just might. <sighs> so after we've, I think O'Brien has enjoyed playing with us back and forth about whether we're in reality or a dream. It, it seems like he's bringing us sort of back down to earth because this dream within a dream dissolves into an unknown room. And now we have people seemingly really present. We have Diana present in a gray dress. We have Yug Yellow and two men, obviously physicians. One, uh, O'Brien describes him as foolish and one very intelligent. I think what we're getting there is that Stephen takes one look at them and can instantly say one of these is a fool and one of these is very smart. There's a third physician wearing the star of a chivalric order, some great royal or courtly order, and the first two are clearly deferring to this decorated physician. He recommends cupping, which is something that your friendly neighborhood acupuncturist will tell you all about, which is using heated glass cups placed on the body to suck up the test tissue and stimulate energy flow. And he also assures them that the leg that Stephen has injured will be fine with Anderson's Basra method, as long as the patient's in reasonable health. And he goes on to comment on Stephen's general health and says that there's a there's a vicious habit of body, some undernourishment, and the text says what he would scarcely hesitate to call incipient melancholia, yet they were to observe that the frame, though spare, was well knit, and there are still some lingering traces of youth to be made out. Well, Mike, I'd be very happy if anybody could ever look me up and down and say there are lingering traces of youth to be made out. Um, but t- tell us about the Basra method. What's going on there? Uh, it's great. It, it, you know, it's fascinating. This Basra method. It, it actually, in 1798, William Eaton, who was the English consul in Basra in Iraq, wrote a letter to a Petersburg doctor describing how an Arabian soldier's broken leg had been treated with a plaster of Paris mold, which held the leg in the correct position. In other words, he had a cast on, like you know we we take for granted nowadays. But at that time. That was pretty unusual. And so even though this letter, you know, was written in 1798, it was, you know, it's some time before that was kind of the, uh, you know, the standard for setting fractures. But in the text, O'Brien goes a little further. He talks about Anderson's Basra method. Anderson was a Swedish medical authority on fractures, and he introduced the Basra method there in Sweden. Wow, it's fantastic, isn't it? And, and like this is the you know the way that we set broken limbs to this very day, right? So you know, Stephen now is a kind of from the intuition which dreams seem to have. Stephen seems to know that this is this is Diana's room. He's actually in Diana's bed while she's spending most of her time sitting on a chaise lounge, looking after him with what he understands to be kind of the utmost tenderness almost all the time, you know, that's, that's what she's spending all her time doing. And he knows somehow, again, that the Aguilo had called in the king's physician. That's the one with the star. And the king's physician is saying, Stephen hears him at this point saying, you know, that there's going to be no beef, mutton, pork for Stephen, just a hazel hen boiled with a little barley. And Stephen thinks, hmm, hazel hen, hmm. never have I seen a hazel hen. Yet, if this good man's advice is followed, I shall soon incorporate one. I shall be in part a hazel hen with whatever virtues a hazel hen may possess. And he reflected upon Finn McCool and his salmon. (laughs) And as, as Stephen reflects... It starts to get dark, lamps are lit, the fireplace is is started, and Stephen sees Diana, and she puts her hand on top of his and says, Oh, Stephen, Stephen, how I wish you could hear me, my dear. (sighs) Well, we're going to have to get back into this conversation with Stephen and Diana. Hopefully, at some point, they're both going to be conscious and and communicating with each other. I, I feel it coming any moment now. But for a second, Mike, we've had honey buzzards in Sweden. Now we have hazel hens. Um, We think that the hazel hen is also known as the hazel grouse. It's a smaller member of the grouse family. Um, It's got a pretty unpleasant, ugly voice, a pretty unpleasant call. I I, I don't think there's any particular sign as to why O'Brien picked a hazel hen. It doesn't seem to have any great symbology. It's not 
is not particularly uncommon, but it's shy and it lives in a dense woodland habitat, so that makes it difficult to find. And Mike, as I read this Finn McCool reference as well, I was thinking, oh yeah, Stephen. Stephen's always chatting about Finn McCool, this kind of Irish mythology. But this is actually the first moment in the canon when Stephen starts to mention this Irishness. And, you know, we, we've said before many times how important signals of Irishness are to O'Brien and how he places them in the character of Stephen here. Um, the salmon of knowledge is probably an easier metaphor to understand than the hazelhead choice. Finn McCool was a great hero, is a great hero in Celtic mythology. There are lots of versions of the Finn McCool story. And one says that the first thing ever created in creation was a hazelnut tree whose branches contained all the knowledge of the world. This sounds a lot like an Irish genesis. The tree grew over the well of wisdom in which lived a great speckled salmon who ate all the hazelnuts. And, you know, Mike, this is terrible. We have salmon in our garden all the time eating the hazelnuts. It's terrible. We have to beat them off. So this this salmon has eaten all the hazelnuts that fell into the well and thus had acquired all the wisdom of the world. And I hope your mental imagery is keeping up with this very, very complicated metaphor. And the prophecy said that the first person to eat the salmon would gain all the knowledge that the salmon had ingested by the hazelnuts falling from the tree. So, a poet named Finnegas, having fished the Boyne River for seven years, finally catches this fish, the salmon of knowledge, and asks his apprentice, called Finn, to cook it but not taste it. However, our Finn, who's... The hero of the story, Finn McCool, burns his thumb while he's turning over the cooking salmon. He puts his scalded burnt thumb in his mouth to ease the pain and accidentally tastes salmon. An early example of contamination in cookery, thus acquiring (laughs) via his thumb all the wisdom of the world. And Finn, Finn McCool, goes on to be a great Irish hero. Wow. It's really fascinating stuff. And, And... Boy, I, you know, I really don't know much Irish mythology, but I, I love how, you know, in as as in all oral traditions, there's, you know, there's variations on the names, there's variations yeah. on things. There's also lots more backstory about, you know, prophecies by Druids and the name of the one who's going to find this. So, you know, young Finn had like a different name that his mother had given him to kind of protect his identity. It's just, it's a fascinating story. And I love, like you said, Ian, you know, isn't it isn't it interesting? You know, it's it's yet another Genesis story and a tree of knowledge. I love this. Mm. So that, uh, and, and and may well, I don't I don't know which predates the other. I haven't looked yeah. that up. Fascinating. <laughs> so St- Stephen drifts back into the evil balloon again, and he knows he realizes to himself he has this dreadful certainty he realizes that they've been rising for hours and they're going up even faster this fills him with in the text here a greater horror than he's ever known diana's green coat he's back to envisaging her in the green coat has the collar turned up and the red underneath the collar sharply contrasts with her pale face white nose and blue lips and we get this really really stark vision that Stephen has of Diana's face. Her face, it says, showed no expression. She was, as it were, completely alone. And as she had done before, she held her head down, bowed over her lap, where her hands, now more loosely clasped, held the diamond, very like a sliver of this brilliant sky itself. She was breathing still, but only just as they floated away, always higher, and into even more rarefied air. Breathing, but only just. A very slight movement indeed. And then even that stopped. Her senses were going, going. Her head drooped forward. The diamond fell. And he started up crying, no, 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 in the extremity of passionate refusal. I'm like, this is not a dream. (laughs) This is a nightmare. Right, right. It's a a nightmare. You know, and and O'Brien was saying it earlier, kind of dreams within dreams and everything else. And this is this is what's happening in Stephen's real life. You know, he's losing Diana in, in his own mind. And, and here in the dream, of course, you know, he's losing Diana. So this is yeah, this is this is his worst nightmare. Yeah. And it's, it's very clever how all, all the way up to this point, both Stephen and we are still confused as right. to whether what we're experiencing is real or a, or a fantasy. Well, in the room. Diana says, so we're now kind of out of Stephen's head and we're, you know, O'Brien's putting us in the room here. Diana says, quiet, Stephen. And she takes him in her arms 
and gets him back into bed, telling him he has to take care of his poor leg. So Stephen has not only been, you know, horrified by this, but he's actually with his broken leg and all his big gash in his stomach jumped out of the bed. Reminds me of, of you know, your particular friend here, me, <laughs> who does that <laughs> often, you know, because I, I have a tendency to move in my dream. So one time right. fending off Voldemort's snake from my dear bride, I leapt over her and onto the carpet, <laughs> did great wow. things for my face. So poor Stephen, get him, get him back. <laughs> so Diana, um, you know, Diana eases him back into bed and, and O'Brien writes that, you know, he'd leaned on her warmth, slipping back through several realities to this, though without much certainty of its existence. So it's like, you know, Stephen's kind of aware and not aware. And, you know, is this real? Is this Diana taking such good care of him like this. And yet his certainty grew stronger as he lay there through the night, watching the glow of the fire, hearing a clock strike the hours. And sometimes she moved about putting on more wood or attending to his squalid needs and doing so with an efficiency and a tenderness that moved him very deeply. And in these short exchanges, his words were relevant and intelligible. So Stephen seems to be kind of coming back to the surface and, and is almost, you know, watching this. It, it, it sounded to me in kind of like, you know, is, is this real? Yeah, it is. It is. You know, everything is like, yeah, this is the way things are supposed to be happening, which is fascinating. And, you know, he's seen something now that I think he hasn't noticed before, right? He, he's noticing a tenderness in here. And this is something new in his experience. Um there had never been any call for, and certainly Mike, we haven't heard about as readers this kind of affectionate tenderness between them. Stephen would not have thought it part of her character. And Mike, I, I, I really noticed the fact that you know, this line about he lent on her warmth, this is the closest any of our characters have got to talking about one one person, one, one lover's physical touch on another, even though it's in a, in, in a moment where Stephen is delirious and sick. It's, it's not a love scene. But it's right. a moment where the two of them are physically together. And that's a very, very special moment, I think, in the canon. Yeah, sure. Of, you know, Jack peering in to watch Diana and Canning through the window. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but or, now we're, we're. You know, Molly Hart or. No, you're right. We haven't had a love, love scene now. Oh, no, indeed. And, and and yet here we are. We do, we do finally get a love scene when Stephen's almost at his lowest ebb and yes. is you know, physically and spiritually remote from his own real reality, I think. And the text says he was weak having been much battered in his physical and metaphysical fall, and having eaten nothing since, weak and somewhat maudlin, and reflecting upon this new dimension, reflecting on her tenderness, he wept silently in the darkness. Yeah. And, I, you know, I love this. Rachel has mentioned before about, you know, Diana perhaps being the, the greatest female character in literature. And, you know, here we have her. You know, O'Brien's telling us, and through Stephen's assessment, you know, she's got courage, she's got spirit, she's got determination. But, you know, he was thinking, yeah, she's generous. Yeah, she's got good nature. But like you say, this tenderness, so new, a, a little bit new to us, certainly yeah. new to Stephen. And then to have Stephen in, in realizing that, you know, weeping silently in the darkness. Huh. <sighs> I, I, I think I need a moment to think about that. Or maybe I just need a moment, <laughs> I, I think we do, and maybe our listeners need to just kind of grab our tissue and, and blink back the tears and perhaps get a snack as we vicariously get nourished up on behalf of Stephen and as we send him our love. We will be right back, dear listeners, right after this break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. We're back. We hope you enjoyed your break. I'm pretty sure, Mike, that Stephen and Diana are back. <laughs> yes. Sure that we're, it sure we're back sounds in. like it, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> because it's morning. And in this morning, Stephen asks Diana if she's awake. And she says she's very happy to find him in his right mind rather than in the balloon nightmare, which she tells him has gone on for days. 
So retrospectively, we get this explanation that this whole kind of several pages worth has been a series of dreams within dreams. He asks, of course, for coffee and he asks for a biscuit. He's ravenously hungry. This is all also coming in response to the pain in his legs. And his mind very quickly turns to his other comfort to laudanum. And he asks if the bottle in his pocket had survived. That's the new laudanum bottle from the apothecary. And I, I don't know if she's aware of the symbolism and the irony, but she tells him pretty flatly that it broke in the fall. It cut him in the side and nearly killed him. And as she gets up to go and get the coffee, he examines this wound and thinks to himself, were I in a still weaker state, I should look upon that as an omen, an awful warning. I'm like, he's, he's still got the hubris of an addict. He's still got the, you know, I, I'm, I'm better than my addiction thing. <laughs> anyway, breakfast comes. And after breakfast, the, the smarter of those two doctors, Dr. Mazenius, calls and Stephen mentions the pain in the leg and just like, yeah, many narc seekers in the world. He's right on the pain and saying, Doctor, can you get me something for this? Right. Mesenius says, well, I, I trust you will not ask me for laudanum. <laughs> like, huh, I'm not going to take you there. Um, he says he's known cases where even one drop coming after a very massive dose, accidental or otherwise, had caused extreme lasting mental distress, even lunacy and death. And he uses a very appealingly kind of military naval metaphor here. Dr. Mersenius says, a wise physician would no more add a drop of laudanum to an already overcharged body than a gunner would take a naked light into a powder magazine. And with that telling remark, he advises Stephen to bear the pain and prescribes a moderate dose of hellebore to deal with agitation. I'm like, I, 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 I enjoyed digging behind hellebore here. Um, so many of the other herbal cures that we've heard about, um, yeah, Jesuit bark and lime juice, and they've all had a connection to modern day medicine. But hellebore is interesting because although it's you know there are, there are references to it in encyclopedias of herbal medicine, the, the, all the many kinds of hellebore, which is a flowering plant, um, have been referred to as a medicinal herb throughout the ages. But we know pretty clearly that they are toxic there's a couple of different varieties there's a white hellebore which is made from a slightly different species there's false hellebore and there's black hellebore and i think that maybe dr mazenius here was thinking of black hellebore it was used by the greek and the romans to treat paralysis all kinds of other diseases insanity it was used as an anti-epileptic um, it was used to treat gout and i think basically these these are all hideous toxicities. Black hellebore itself was what's known as melampode, which in or in Greek melanorizon, which means a low lying plant. It's a low lying plant with dark shiny leaves, hence the melano bit, and has pure white flowers. It appears in the winter, and that gets it the name of Christmas rose. And lots of us might know Christmas rose as the same thing as hellebore. The black hellebore used by the Greeks as a herbal has been given the the kind of species name. Helleborus officinalis, but there are many others. They all have this bewildering variety of properties. Like I said, anti-epileptic, um, anti-gout, uh, a purgative, used to induce sickness, used to induce abortion in pregnant women, all kinds of basically toxicities that get dressed up as therapeutic interventions. Um, O'Brien, I think, is inviting us to compare a plant laudanum that is deadly due to its addictive properties with a plant that is plain outright deadly. And we, we're we left to sort of think openly which one is actually worse. And Mike, you, you and I have both been at different times to the poison garden at Annick Castle in Northumberland in England. And you can go on a tour of this poison garden. It's very, very seriously safely locked away. The garden is under lock and key and there are fences and you're not allowed in there without a guide because there are some really deadly toxic plants in there. And if you take the tour as you go in, they point to this kind of innocuous leafy green shrub on the way in. And the tour guide will say, this plant right here has killed more people than all the others in the garden put together. And that plant is the tobacco plant. <laughs> so hellebore, deadly. You'd think somebody would be crazy to prescribe it. But I think O'Brien is telling us you'd be just as crazy to set your medical store by something as addictive as laudanum. Right, right. And Stephen, I think, appreciates Mercinius's courage to kind of bring this up. 
and and to, you know just be so direct with him you know colleague you know you're not going to ask me to prescribe laudanum are you and he's you know and you know he thinks to himself well you know Chris Hicks was right given what he knew about Stephen and we're back as you said into the kind of the addict's mind here and O'Brien writes you know, this is Stephen saying that he, Mercinius, obviously thought that his patient was addicted to laudanum, and he had no means of knowing, as Stephen knew, that this frequent and indeed habitual use was not true addiction, but just the right side of it. Ha, ha, <laughs> right? ha. The boundary was difficult to define, and he did not blame Mercinius for his mistake, the less so as his body was at the moment feeling more than a hint of that craving, which was the mark of a man who had gone too far. So <laughs> even here, right? You know, this reminds me of the days when, you know, we used to say that, you know, if you fall down in the gutter, but you don't have to hang on, you're not really drunk yet. Now this, you know, naval <laughs> standards, that's a new thing for that. But, you know, here's Stephen like, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm even having withdrawal. Hmm. Yeah. But, but really I'm okay. But, you know, Stephen, you know, now I, I guess he has no choice to but to forego the laudanum, but it sounds like he kind of wants to do that, but he really wants to get his emotional state under control. He doesn't want to be weeping more or behaving badly in front of Diana. So, uh oh, you know, here we go. He <laughs> asked Diana, you know, my dear, bring me that package of mine you know she's saying oh the leaves that make you clever and witty you know and she's saying but wait wait you know the doctor told me not to give you any laudanum are you sure these won't hurt you and he says you know and i i'm thinking back to the, <laughs> the boys in garden and he says never in life my dearest soul the peruvians and their neighbors chew coca day and night it is as usual as tobacco <laughs> yes oh, it is yes. And if tobacco is usual to you, then we know what's coming. Oh, sadly. <sighs> yeah. When you look up hubris in the dictionary, it says, see Stephen Matcher in C, Laudanum Addiction. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, cross, Cross-reference, self-denial. Very good. So Stephen is left to the care of Jagiello's valet, who shaves him. He does get hold of the, co- the cocoa leaves to consolidate his mind and take away his sense of taste. All the better, it says, to deal with this disagreeable emulsion that the doctors are sent for him to take as a as part of his convalescence. After three days of nursing him, with a tenderness that bound him to Diana even more, she had come to sit with him and says she's just realised that she'd lost her wits the day that they'd met. She says, how foolish I had been. The letter that Stephen had asked about might have been his answer. And Mike, it's it's really, really tender that all the way through this this chapter, you might say this chapter and a half, we've had this mention of the letter kind of being dripped into the conversation. We've we're not getting one big reveal. They're both coming back to it kind of really painfully, step by step. Stephen said that yes, it's true, the letter that he had given Ray was his answer to her letter about rumors that he'd been flaunting up and down the Mediterranean with a red headed Italian mistress. And Diana says, I don't want to go over ancient history, but with Stephen doing so well, she doesn't want him to think that she was unfeeling or altogether stupid. And that's quite an admission, I think. That's quite a concession from Diana. He said he'd never thought that she was either, meaning unfeeling or stupid. And confidentially, he says this letter was hard to write. They were about to leave. He had had to write quickly. He had thought that Ray was indeed the best chance to get the letter to her since he was going by land. And because he had, truthfully, seemed to have been flaunting a red-headed lady from Valletta to Gibraltar, uh, and that it had appeared to, to all and sundry that she was his mistress. And he's recounting this story to her. He said he had to get Laura away quickly from the French agents, that it was a matter of naval intelligence. And, Mike, I think he's happier to say now in in in-person conversation many months after the event that this was about intelligence. I don't think he could have said fairly and lawfully that this was an intelligence matter in a, in a letter under, you know, under somebody else's hand. Yeah, absolutely not. No, exactly. Um, This had damaged Laura's reputation and it had damaged his. He talks with regret about how even Jack had believed it and should have known better. And Diana says, well, I was furious that that, that all these letters that had come in for Sophie on the Navy ships, not a word from Stephen for her. 
and they're having this nice reconciliation. He says, I understand the anger. It would have been against the law for me to write about matters of intelligence in a letter that could have fallen into the wrong hands. And he had found in any case that nobody believed his assertions to the contrary. And Mike, this was played for laughs in a way. We we kind of enjoyed the comedy of misunderstandings back in Treason's Harbour. But it's really painful that Stephen remembers it here. Nobody believed him. He said they all smiled and looked knowing. Perhaps it was because she had red hair. And I, I like this description of the husband that kind of seals the the his account of the situation here. The husband, he says, was as far removed from the Marie Complaisant as you can imagine. The husband knew that red hair and chastity were perfectly compatible. And like a, a Marie Complaisant, that's a complacent husband, a husband who accepts adultery on behalf of his wife. And he's saying, Lieutenant Fielding, no way was right. he going to be going along with the idea. Right. Wildly jealous guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Diana is listening to this. And I think she's, you know, she's, she's kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, so let me, let me be clear. So she was not your mistress. And Stephen says, you know, absolutely not. You know, I've said that I will say it on the Holy Cross. And Diana's like, no, 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 don't do that. But then she wonders and she asks Stephen, so if she wasn't your mistress, why did you ask me to forgive you? And, and I thought Stephen just nailed this. He said, because I had so mismanaged things that you thought I needed forgiveness, because I caused you distress, because I was too stupid to send a copy of my letter by Theseus, because I was fool enough not to suspect that traitor Ray. And Diana says, oh, Stephen, I have used you barbarously, barbarously. And then after a pause, she says, but I will make it up to you if ever I can. I will make it up to you in any way you like. And I'm thinking, uh, uh, is this is this it? Is Am it, I hearing what I'm hearing? It, it's like Diana saying, you're saying she wasn't your mistress. I'm saying, Diana, are you saying you're coming back? What's going on here? Right? Well, we think that we might be about to get that resolution. But guess what? We get interrupted. The action gets <laughs> undercut in, in traditional style. Dr. Mesenius comes in to check on his patient. And Stephen, who's clearly now feeling kind of more up in his spirits and confident that matters might be going to proceed, he asks if Dr. Mazenius would object to Stephen leaving in a day or two, that there's a ship coming for him. Mazenius says that's going to be fine as long as you travel by coach and get directly into a cot. And when he learns that the ship is coming from Riga, he tells Stephen to be easy in his mind. The winds could not have allowed the ship to leave until today. So there's been nothing about Stephen's delay in his recovery that has caused him to to delay or miss out on any of the possible uh, contact with Jack here. And we're, we're, we're back into happy times here. Diana says, oh, I'm going to have time to pack. And in a happy tone, she asks Stephen what she would do when he's in South America. And Mike, this is, this is a really nice moment. As, as they're starting to make a plan, we've been looking ahead anxiously, anxiously, anxiously unsure for what feels like all of the first half of the canon. And now these two are making a plan together. Right. And, you know, and, and, and I'll tell you, I just, uh, you know, I, like I said, we, we always say no spoilers, but this is a very short spoiler. For me, these last pages of this chapter are some of my longest, happiest, smiling, loving this that at least that I remember and, and have, have passed through this in this circumnavigation. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <sighs> and we're left wondering if, if we're so happy like is is this real and is Stephen going to realize the happiness and and if everybody's going to get happy how how are they going to actually mark the happiness how are we going to wind this story to a close let's get back into it Stephen tells her you know what should you do well you know while I'm gone you stay with Sophie and look for a place for your Arabians and and you know look for us to buy a house in London you know I heard that that house we had on the Half Moon Street is for sale and, you know, she asks him how long he'll be gone. And he says, you know, he hopes it's not long, but uh, sadly, he's going to have to be afloat pretty much all of the time until Bonaparte is defeated. You know, Diana coming from a military family, she understands that. She says, you know what? I am going to stay with Sophie. I'll use Jack's stables. And then she asks if he really meant it about them buying a house in London. She says, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're so expensive. And Stephen now tells her about his inheritance. And, you know, after telling her, 
how much money he has, you know, that the interest alone is an admiral's salary. He says that, you know, when the peace comes, you know, we can buy a house in Paris, too. <laughs> you know, I, I recognize Diana is back here. She goes, oh, what joy, Stephen. Could we really? I should love that. What a sad mercenary creature I am. I find my heart is quite thumping with happiness. I was quite pleased to have my husband back, but to find him covered with gold from head to foot as well fairly throws me into transports. How vulgar. <laughs> you know, she springs up from her seat, walks around the room with this elastic step, and then she looks out the window and says, there's Jack Yellow in his coach. And Lord, she cried, he has Jack Aubrey beside him on the box. Oh, it's this is the... This beautifully theatrical acceleration of all of the joy and the celebration at the end. Here is Jack. Jack comes into the room, kisses Diana. It's, it's funny how he kisses her in his uh, absent cousinly way, as, as right. Brian describes it, asks Stephen how he's doing, and then they get straight into talking about the surprise and her trip back. Jack's very pleased with his shopping trip to Riga. He says, we have a dozen bolts of the kind of Paul Lavey they serve out in heaven. Stephen introduces Diana to Reverend Martin, who's also walked in. She says, I believe, sir, you are the only gentleman among our friends that has been bitten by a night ape. So that's really great knowledge by Diana. She's right in. She doesn't need any continuity or exposition help. They all get on to talking about the unusual animals that Martin has seen while they're sitting drinking coffee. And Stephen asks Jack then if it's okay if they come aboard tonight. Mercenius had said yes. And Jack says, our favorite phrase, Mike, I should like it of all things. Mm -hmm. Jack's not sure that the favorable breeze will last much longer. The, the pace is picking up here. Yagiela says, well, I can find a door to carry Stephen down to the ship. We'll drive him slowly in the coach. We'll get a colonel's escort. And you can kind of see all the, all the characters gathering on the stage here for the big tableau at the end of the play. Stephen asks Diana if that's okay with her or whether she needs more time to pack. I'm like, this is one of my favorite lines of Diana Villiers' dialogue. Me give too. Me a, give me a couple of hours, said Diana with shining eyes, and I am your man. And <laughs> of all the people in this story who are our man, it, it's Diana. Amen. So Jack and Yagiello go off for a door to carry Stephen on. Diana goes off to pack with the help of one of Yagiello's maids. And Mike, we're almost all set here. We are. And then, unfortunately, there's just a, a little bit of turn here. You know, Stephen hears Bonded's voice downstairs, and he asks Martin if Padine is with him. And now we get Martin says, oh, Captain Polings had to put him in irons that morning oh because, gosh. yeah, Martin had found him siphoning laudanum and replacing it with brandy. And Stephen, you know, thinks, oh, my gosh, you know, I was such a simpleton to have missed this. And then Stephen's really upset when he hears about all of Padine's violence when his bottle was taken away from him. And, mm. and he feels like it's his fault, Stephen does. And that, you know, he says, you know, well, we just can't turn Padine out into the world as an opium eater. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of put that down to one side. We're going to have to deal with that. And, and I think Stephen, you know, is, is so upset that Martin is kind of tending to, all right, let me pull him back in a little bit. So he starts talking about the trip to Riga and the birds mm. he saw. You know, Diana comes back in, and now Stephen has another great shock. Diana is standing there wearing the green riding habit that he had seen so vividly and in such detail in his dreams. Yeah. So now, double, now yeah, getting... double take, as Patrick O'Brien almost certainly never said to himself. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it's almost like a little magical realism, you know, sort of yeah. you know, <laughs> it, it infuses its way in here. Um, but she says that the coach is going to be around in five minutes. Um, and they're, you know, they're bringing up a door to collect Stephen. And with Stephen in the coach, you know, uh, Martin's going to hold him up. And so there's not going to really be room with the door and Martin and Stephen for her. So she's going to ride ahead. She's, you know, packed a couple of trunks. She'll have the rest ship later. Um, and, you know, when she goes in, when she rides into town, she'll grab his things from the hotel. She'll buy some flowers to <laughs> decorate the room on the ship. And Stephen says, oh, my dear, you know, if you don't mind, stop at the apothecary and buy all the cocoa leaves he has left. Oh, Stephen, a reformed man. Yeah. <laughs> I've changed my, my drug of choice here. So, 
Uh, she says that she'll need some money. And then again, you know, kind of in this new little tiny kind of meet cute, she turns to Reverend Martin and says, you see, Mr. Martin, what horse leeches we wives do become. You know, here I am going for Stephen's money. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we've got Diana solo on horseback, which is a reach back all the way to the very beginning right. of her arc. Yeah, it's great. Ah, oh, almost at the end. We're back on the surprise. We've got the Shelmastonian crew members. We've got West, who's the only officer present who's on deck. And we take West's point of view for a minute as he sees an extraordinarily handsome woman right along the quay. She comes up the brow and goes below. He follows her, saying, well, Man, this is, this is Dr. Maturin's cabin, and who are you? And she turns and says, I am his wife, sir, and I beg you will desire the carpenter to sling a cot for me here. She pointed, and then, bending and peering out of the scuttle, she cried, Here they are. Pray let people stand by to help him aboard. He will be lying on a door. She urged West out of the cabin and on deck, and there he and the amazed foremast hands saw a blue and gold coach and four, escorted by a troop of cavalry in mauve coats with silver facings, driving slowly along the quay, with their captain and a Swedish officer on the box, their surgeon and his mate leaning out of the windows, and all of them, now joined by the lady on the deck, singing, Ah, tutti contenti saremo così, ah, tutti contenti saremo, saremo così, with surprisingly melodious, full-throated happiness. Ah, <sighs> happily ever after. One of my favorite romance genres. <laughs> <laughs> End of chapter nine, end of the letter of Mark. Wow. Great wow. stuff. It really Mike, is great stuff. Oh, great, great story. What, what, what are you thinking as we look back? How, what are your thoughts on the book overall? You know, I, it, it's so funny. And, you know, who I, I say this too often, I'm sure. Who could do this but O'Brien, right? Who could cue us up with this big trip to South America, run us through a book that I just loved, and by the way... <laughs> We haven't even thought about leaving for South America yet, you know, but, oh my God, Stephen and Diana coming back together, Jack, you know, seemingly well positioned to uh, get back on the list. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm loving it. How about oh. you, Ian? Oh, I, it's been a great book. It's one of those ones that I hadn't quite remembered from my previous circumnavigations, just what great moments there are in here, what great turning points in the story, and some really beautiful, really intense writing, of course, as well. Yes. yes. So it, it, in a moment, we have to think to ourselves about what are we going to look forward to. But right now, we've got something for us all to look forward to in this episode to celebrate the new year. We have a special treat. We got to meet with Jeff Hunt, illustrator and artist. Um, in the words of Patrick O'Brien himself, Jeff Hunt's pictures, perfectly accurate in period and detail, but very far from merely representational, are often suffused with a light reminiscent of Canaletto. Canaletto, famous Italian painter from the Venetian school of the 18th century. And as is so often the case with O'Brien's writing, that reference gives us, I think, the encouragement to learn more. So we got to sit down and talk with Jeff Hunt. We're very, very lucky to have talking to us today, Jeff Hunt. Jeff, as most of you I'm sure know, is a, an illustrator and artist, creative cover art for a whole range of works of literature, but especially, and most importantly, the Aubrey Matry novels of Patrick O'Brien and Jeff. It's great to have you with us today. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Tell us this story of how you first got involved in producing cover art for these books. Uh, well, I, I was involved in doing a lot of book covers uh, as a commercial illustrator. Um, in fact, I did, I stopped counting when I got to 200. So I've done a fair number of book covers in my time. And um, a number of them, this was back in the, I guess, the 19, early 1980s. There were quite a lot of naval writers around then of whom Patrick was only one. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't illustrating his his work then. And uh, my my book cover work came through an illustrator's agent, who mm -hmm. I, I still deal with. And one day, the guy that I was dealing with at that time at Artist Partners rang up 
with another job and said, we've, we've got a possible cover by a writer called Patrick O'Brien. Would that interest you? Well, I'd, I'd already read all 11, the first 11 of the books. Wow. And uh, so I knew them very well by that time because I'd been reading them anyhow. And so I sort of, I left the phone hanging in midair and said, you know, wait there, I'll be right there. And, uh, and dashed in to, uh, to pick up the brief. And that was the end of 1987. Mm-hmm. And the situation was that they'd been using um, uh, another illustrator, a friend of mine, actually, Paul Wright, mm-hmm. who's very good at painting metal ships, dreadnoughts, battleships, that kind yeah. of thing. That's his speciality area, really. And he'd not been all that happy with working on the Patrick O'Brien. He's not all that happy with sailing ships. Mm-hmm. They weren't all that happy with, with him. So they wanted a change of illustrator. And so they called me in kind of in the middle of the series with the uh, letter of Mark. Nice. And they said, well, you know, we'd like you to start the letter of Mark, which is just in manuscript form then, and then work backwards through the series and forwards simultaneously as new manuscripts appeared. So that was that was kind of how it, it all began. But it's an unusual situation to find yourself in because I'd worked on lots of series of mm. novels and usually uh, you you tend to get locked into a writer's work as mm. the cover illustrator yeah. at the beginning when they start mm. writing the series of books yeah. and and so you kind of sort of develop with with them in a kind of a way but with patrick he'd already written you know the essentially the bulk of the series and i knew it very well so i all i already had this overview of of what he was about and what the what his view of naval history was about. So, so it gave me the opportunity to take the same view that he was taking in a way, which is to perceive uh, the Royal Navy in its glory days. You know? So it was a fantastic opportunity to, to do that. So, and away I went and, uh, and, uh, and started work on the covers. I'm, I'm just so taken I'm I'm sort of basking in in hearing about that and coming in and so grateful that it happened. I'm glad they decided to make a change. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) Did you talk to O'Brien at any point? Jeff, I know he said some really nice things about you. Yeah, he he was very complimentary. It was very nice. His his modus operandi was uh, the, for each book, I would do pencil sketches for my own interest, really. And then I would submit uh, a little colour sketch, life-size to the finished printed book cover. And that went to the art director of the publishing house, but it also went to Patrick. So he Ah. saw that for every book. And um, almost every time, I can only think of two exceptions off the top of my head, one exception, really, he would just write me this very polite, Note, dear Mr. Hunt, you know, thank you very much again for your splendid interpretation of da 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 da. Your sincerely, Patrick O'Brien. And but he loved to keep people at arm's length, you know. Yeah. So he liked writing stuff. Yeah. But in the end, I did meet him. I met him, uh, oh, four, five, maybe six times, I guess. Wow. And he uh, uh, here and in the U.S. Uh, at this big um, dinner, they they stage for him at Greenwich Painted Hall yeah. uh, there. Um, and then eventually he cracked and he invited uh, my wife and myself to lunch with he and Mary up at his uh, one of his London clubs, his London club. So um, so that was a, another interesting opportunity. But uh, but he was, uh, I mean, you probably know this anyway, but he, he was a man that didn't like question and answer and yeah. didn't yeah. like... He didn't like face-to-face conversations very much. He would prefer you to be on the end of a pen somewhere. You know, one one mailed stamp away from you is what he liked to do. And that was how he liked to, you know, conduct his his affairs. But, but, I mean, you know, I never had any uh, personal problems with him at all. I mean, he was... But he was very um, formal, you know, very... Right. And when you met him face to face, he was very uh, correct, very formal man you know, all through his life, I guess. But, uh, I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever actually asked him a question. I might have done once, um, 
I think I probably did. He probably slapped me down, I expect, because you weren't going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. was, was he interested in, in talking to you more about art? Did you get the sense that he was curious about either the process or about your inspiration or about any of the scholarship? Was no, it- not really, because he could see, I guess, that we were coming to the project from the same sources um, okay. because we both... Uh, went to the Maritime Museum to consult the ship drafts. We we yeah. both knew David Lyon. Um, we both read uh, the ship's logbooks in the um, National Archive. Yeah. And in fact, just about every incident that occurs in the books uh, of a factual character is either drawn from James's naval history, which I've got a copy of, I've got an 1850 edition, I think, 1860 edition, um, or else from the logbooks themselves. I mean, because you, you, you know, just to, to go to the National Archive and read the logbooks, you just get completely immersed. You know? And um, and the detail is is phenomenal. And when I'm researching the, the kind of studio paintings, fine art paintings I do now, my starting point is always go to the National Archive, read the original logbook and see what the master was up to at that on that particular hour and what was going on. And obviously that's something that was his wellspring of inspiration as well. So he never asked me stuff about that because he already knew that, yeah. that I knew that, you know. And he, he was interested in art, but he was interested in kind of higher art. I mean, he would talk about Picasso and things yeah. like that the quality of Picasso's line and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, but I'm not sure he was, apart from liking the work that I did for his covers, I mean, I don't think he was all that interested in my history or how I got to where I was, really. I mean, it would kind of make sense to me because I, I suspect he wanted nobody to be interested in his. So <laughs> why bring this topic up? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe that's maybe that's the case. Yeah, he had quite a lot to hide you know right. yeah, yeah, indeed. I'm just curious because it's the first time I've spoken to anybody who's actually met Mary and I've often wondered if if she kind of whispered into the ear of Patrick from time to time any impressions of her or her involvement in stories or you oh know. she well the only the only time I when did I meet her I think I met her twice but the main time I met her was when we had lunch at his right. club. Right. And she, at that point, she was very much in his shadow. He did all the talking. He, you know, he did all the talking for all four of us, actually, is what he did. <laughs> and, um, but the only thing that, that was a little bit kind of odd was that, oh, the first thing he did was to order for her, which I was kind of surprised for. He said, you're going to have da-da-da-da-da-da when the waiter wow. came around here. So, and she just sort of looked a little bit rocked back but went with it maybe you know maybe it was one of the acts but then but then there was a curious episode quite far into this lunch where she sp- that we were we had a very nice waitress who was Romanian or Polish something vaguely Eastern European and at one point Mary addressed this waitress who came to the table in very fluent French and I thought, I wonder if, because she's, Mary seemed a little bit vague, and I thought, I wonder if she's really lost it and she really still thinks she's in Paris or something. But then on second thoughts, looking back on it, I thought, maybe maybe she's just playing me along. Maybe she's just, maybe this is an act and she's just throwing this across my path so that I'll think something different about her to how she actually is. I don't know. They're a very difficult couple to read as yeah. a couple, I would guess. Yeah. And it, and it sounds like that was how they chose to be, as much as how they they, they naturally were as well. From things that oh, happened. I'm sure, right, I'm right. sure, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, because they just they just lived completely together, and all the work was done together, and they'd done that for whatever the hell it was, fifty yeah, years. Yeah. You know, I mean, constantly together, constantly working on the on the on his books, basically. That's fascinating. Can I go back to the idea of the visual art for a minute? In the text, one of the moments, one, one of the kinds of moments where Patrick O'Brien gets very poetic and very, very rich in imagery is when he's talking about light. He talks about sky. He talks about light. He talks about colour a lot, which mm. you know, suggests a bit of a visual sense. Did, did, did that draw you in as somebody who obviously also cares about light and colour and visual representation as, as you're reading the books? Or did it play into any of the ideas that you have for cover art? Uh, no, 
I guess it did. I guess it did read into uh, what I was doing for him. I wasn't really conscious of that at the time. I mean, I was conscious of the books mm. as an amazing piece of scene setting, yeah. um, which is kind of what they are. I mean, there, there isn't, <laughs> what should I say? They're, they're not books with plots, particularly. Oh, oh. I mean, they're just awesome pieces of uh, an illusory late 18th, early 19th century world recreated in all its detail and that's that is the, the fantastic achievement that you you know you take patrick's world as the reality wow. of what it was really like that's that is the thing i mean he just brought this extraordinary memory and erudition to bear upon recreating a world and and unlike like all fiction i guess it's uh, it's it's a world of illusion, but it's 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 completely convincing, you know. Uh, like all like all good art, it, in its own terms, it's totally convincing. So, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I wasn't really aware of um, atmosphere, except in certain cases, uh, the pursuit of the um, leopard by the Wachsamheit yeah. in these very stormy seas. You know, I had to really stretch out and use imagination there because uh, I've never been in seas like that and I'm pretty damn sure Patrick hadn't either so that was uh, an evocation of storm at sea and that was a uh, that was a wonderful thing but uh, if I may it's a very very memorable cover the the the, the, the Vaxham hike chase is absolutely in the in the cover art for Desolation Island and it, it's one of the ones that sticks with me there are a few of them stick with me for different reasons but that's one that I really really remember ah oh, thanks going right back to the beginning, really, um, about this thing of me coming into the series when it had already been half written. When I got this job and I knew I was going to be doing the whole series, going backwards and forwards, I just went back to the studio and for, for two weeks I did nothing else but doodle little uh, tiny thumbnail pencil drawings. And I was really reflecting... I wasn't really reflecting on Patrick's novels, actually. I was reflecting on naval history and picking out little scenes, and some of them could be applied to Patrick's books, and that was one of them. Um, that was one of the ones that made it through to made it through the cut. But not all of them did. I mean, some of them I subsequently turned into other paintings for other reasons, but I was just sort of meditating on the world of, of the Royal Navy in its, in its glory days, really. Mm -hmm. yeah which is, I guess, what he was doing. While, while we're being kind of fanboys here of, of you, and Patrick and Mary, you mentioned working on Master and Commander, the Peter Weir movie. Yeah, how did that come about and anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, well, not a lot, really, because I still don't know really how it came about because um, Peter Weir phoned me out of the blue and I, I didn't have any idea who he was. He, he just said... You know, we're maybe thinking in the future of producing a film movie based on Patrick O'Brien's novels. And and he did that three times over. He phoned me up and I got the impression that he was just bouncing ideas off me because I wasn't actually involved in his industry but I knew about the books and I knew about stuff, you know. Oh. And I I really got the impression that he was just trying out ideas on me. I can't I can't quote any of the conversations offhand, but I mean <laughs> he was even going into details about um uh script, you know, lines that could appear in the script and stuff like that. And by about the third phone call, I mean this is, this occurred over a period of a few months, I don't know. By about the third phone call, I didn't know who he was. And on the fourth phone call, I said, I said, I said to him, I said, Peter, it's very nice of you to keep calling up like this and us having this chat. But uh, but I think maybe next time you ought to put me on the payroll. And uh, so I didn't hear from him after that. <laughs> but he did uh, put myself and my wife on the opening night of Master and Commander at Leicester Square. Wow! So nice. I got to introduce my wife to Russell Crowe, which. Uh, which oh. was good news for quite a while. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's points, uh, points in the bank right there. Good it thing. was, yeah. And, yeah. And, and I'm sure you know that you're, you're credited on the movie as well for what it's like. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, way, way down the list. Yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. 
Yeah, but the only other thing that I did was um, a couple of the production guys came to the studio um, oh. after you know, around about the second or third phone call from Peter, uh, to try and mainly what they were interested in was a, a lot of detail because at that point they were busy reconstructing the, <coughs> quote, HMS Rose, unquote, yeah. to be right. HMS right. Surprise. And they wanted a hell of a lot of really fine detail, which I wasn't able to supply and I don't think anyone else could have done either because, uh, I mean, it was stuff like, uh, what was the figurehead? I mean, the figurehead was something they were really anxious on getting right. But who knows? You know, who knows what the figurehead of HMS Surprise was? Unless you were, you chanced really lucky somewhere and found a document, you'd never know what it was. You know? So I couldn't really help them on key visual things that they wanted to know. Um, but I, I did, because by that time, I was already producing uh, art prints of the book covers. So I gave them, I think, about three of those to take away because I had some proofs of those. Yeah. And a couple of them made it onto the movie as scenes. They were actual. Uh, the only one I can think of offhand would be uh, Letter of Mark because Letter of Mark has got Aubrey and uh, one of the lieutenants right on the, standing on the foremast top gallant truck. You know, and that is a scene in the movie that was clipped yeah. out and used as a scene in the movie. But uh, apart from that, there wasn't a hell of a lot of involvement. But, you know, it was interesting to be mixed up in it. Uh, and I got to meet a lot of people that were working on it as well. I mean, um, Gordon Laco and people like that I met subsequently in the States yeah. at some of these seminars. So, yeah, it was all, it was all good fun. I want to use that as a pivot, if that's OK, to talk about the representations of characters. Because it... It's certainly a feature that, that I've noticed that the characters are there just a little, or they're they're you know in in the context of a very wide view of the, of a ship or a scene, and you don't get the impression that y your imagination of Jack Aubrey and Stephen Matron and Diana Villiers and Sophia and all the rest of them they're not really front and center in the imagery, mm, right? And that's you can see why that would make a huge amount of sense given your, your approach to the art but you can also see that the books are very strongly driven by these two characters who've been placed in this world so was there ever any discussion of how prominent to make the characters in the cover art or whether to show any more about the the, the characteristics or the arc of of jack and stephen and the rest of them no there was never any of that i think the i think the art director right from the word go, realised that he was going to be between a rock and a hard place because he had Patrick on one side and me on the other side and we both knew what we were talking about in huge mm -hmm. detail. Yeah. Um, so he just let me get on with it and let Patrick get on with it. And But there were, there were kind of, there's kind of three things to say about that, <clears throat> about figures not appearing very much in the illustrations. And the first thing is, A, I tend to avoid figures because I'm not very good at them. A, that's, that's A. Um, B, I did actually feel quite strongly. I mean, it always annoys me when I see on a book cover or something somebody else's representation of how I had viewed a character ah. um, through reading the book. And I, I didn't want to impose that on other people. So that's that's kind of one of the things I felt as well. And I guess I guess the third thing as well is that the... The physical viewpoint that I'd taken was, I think you, you kind of said it in a way, Ian, just now, um, his characters inhabit a world. It's the world of the Royal Navy. But, I mean, to me, and I guess to him, the important thing is recreating that world. So in a way, in a, kind, a funny kind of way, individual personalities are not quite as important as the whole picture so visually I tried to to do that by not coming back so far off the ship that you see the whole thing and the mastheads and all the rest of it so it's just a ship portrait but to come in just close enough so you start to see the figures but they're part of their ship they're part of that world so that was kind of I mean philosophically if there was a philosophical approach to it that's that's kind of where I was and uh, and the art director bless him kept well out of the way you know it just, <laughs> it just nothing uh, nothing uh, there were only two interventions on 
ideas that I'd put up. And one of them was, let's quote for a title here, where's the, where's the volcano exploding on the far side of the world? The 13 guns salute. Wine Dark Sea, of course it is. Wine Dark Sea, yeah. Um, I submitted that and Patrick asked if the volcano could be a bit more crimson. That was that. Was that. Wow. <laughs> that, that's a, one of the only interventions that he ever did. Well, there was only one other intervention. Must have been the nutmeg of consolation, probably. True love, wind up, see, who knows? It's a pursuit. Um, but they wanted an island in the distance because Norfolk Island appears in this novel. Yeah. And and somebody, I don't think it was Patrick actually, I think it was the art director, wondered, I think Patrick had mentioned this, if Norfolk Island could appear on the horizon. Yeah. And but I I analyzed Patrick's track log of these two ships and I proved that it was physically impossible for <laughs> it to be visible well, because they'd been running they'd been running for 24 hours by that that point. So it wasn't, yeah. <laughs> um but anyway, so that was that one. And then um and you know the story about the uh the two book covers that were reversed, I guess. Oh. Originally, all the book covers we're going to be one particular way round, and the lettering block was going to be offset to one side. And at one point, the publishers, without referring to me, reversed two of the images left to right. Oh, wow. And they were HMS Surprise, which is that one of her coming up to, yeah. wherever the hell it is, in, uh, in Bombay. Yeah. Bombay, thank yeah. you. And the other one was Fortune of War. And doing that, they didn't they didn't refer to me at all. They just reversed these images left to right. Gosh. And that introduced errors into the paintings. Yeah. Uh, and nobody's ever spotted the errors in the uh, Mauritius Command uh, painting because they're very abstruse rigging mistakes. But I did get picked up on the other one, which was uh, Fortune of War, because in Fortune of War, you're looking up from a frigate's uh, gun deck, up through the open spars and the boat deck, and you can see a marine firing over the side of the ship. Yeah. Reversing the image left to right makes the marine a left-hander. Ah. And I had a letter from a gentleman in Ohio who said that he was the president of his local black powder shooting club, and he could tell me that if you try and shoot a musket left-handed, it'll take your eye out. Oh. And the reason is that muskets have flintlock mechanisms, but they were only ever made for right-handers. So the flintlock mechanism is on the offside if you're a right-hander. But if you try and fire it left-handed, the flintlock's going to be right next to your eye. Wow. So I, I took huge pleasure in writing back. And <laughs> Don't blame me. No, right. Uh, and the other odd one was... Um, uh, at some point, at what point? What point in the series? Originally, all the books were just going to be front covers. Yeah. And on one of them, which must have been, I think it's 13 Gun Salute. Is it 13 Gun Salute where you're looking up past a frigate which is being heaved in towards one of these South Atlantic rocky islands? Mm. I can't remember what name Patrick gives it now not Desolation Island, one of those. Anyway, you're looking up past the frigate towards the island and the seabirds around, and they've launched a boat to try and tow them off because there's no wind and they're getting pushed in towards the island. At that point, once that painting had been done, the publishers decided that the paintings, the illustrations, were going to be wraparound. They'd wrap around the back cover as well. Yeah. So I had to paint the back cover and the spine and they digitally spliced it, which in those yeah. days seemed like black magic. Yeah, <laughs> it's not all that long ago now, but I mean, you wouldn't think twice about doing that now, but then that seemed like sheer magic. So they spliced these two paintings, so they fitted exactly going around the cover. Yeah, but that was, uh, that was uh, an oddity, really. <laughs> and that's the only Patrick O'Brien painting I've still got. I've got the back cover. <laughs> oh, wow. Which is just a bit of sea and some birds. <laughs> nice. Sometimes, it's, supposedly, Norton is has released 
uh, you know, a new series and there we've got new cover art and, and they've said that, you know, part of the rationale behind this is to appeal more to women because they're, you know, women are heavily a part of the story, but in all the original summaries on the backs of the books and all the, you know, art related to the books, you know, you never see any, any women. And, and interestingly, even in the movie master and commander, you know, we kind of see one no scene. Women. Yeah, no that's one. Right. There's, there's one and that's it. And it's fascinating. Right. I don't know. You know, if that's ever come up or was ever discussed or, you know, if anybody ever thought about that? No, not, not, no. Well, not that I heard. I mean, I guess maybe the publishers might have talked it over, but um, yeah, it is a curiosity, isn't it? You know, it, it, it was always pitched right the way through as a, as a, you know, a masculine naval story right, right. through. But in fact, a lot of it, particularly some of the earlier books, there, there's a massive amount of um, ordinary civilian society and lots of women doing stuff. And yeah, I mean, that's obviously something that, you know, nagged away at, at Patrick. You know, it's obviously something that he was extremely interested in, but it, it doesn't, it's never really come out you know, either as the book covers or, as you say, as uh, as the movie. I mean, there was no hint that there was a, you right. know, a civil society. <laughs> you know, you're just in the, in a vacuum, really. It, which which is kind of a shame, I think. You know, it could have, you know, the it could have been an interesting series of films had they done it differently. Yes. It could have oh. been. And I know Russell Crowe wanted to do that. Yeah, yeah. he was always keen on doing that. That was. Yeah. But but the kind of way it had been set up, they kind of they kind of you know ploughed their way through you know three or four of the books it, it, on mass just to just to create one script out of it, and I think they kind of I think they regretted it afterwards and missed a trick because uh, you know it would it would have been it would have been very interesting to have to have something like. Treason's Harbour kind of uh, scenario entering into yeah. it, you know, the intelligence scene on land and, yeah, yeah. you know, shenanigans with the French and, and all this kind of thing. That would have that would have made an interesting film, I think, but, you know, it was not to yeah. be. We hear in, in the world of movie gossip that um, Patrick Ness has been commissioned to screenwrite a prequel, to screenwrite a, a Patrick O'Brien-based movie based on presumably the earlier books before Far Side of the World. Now, that's good. That would yeah. be good, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it would be good if you, oh, well, if you just take, took Master and Commander, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you could kind of do that. Uh, we'd yeah. love to see, uh, you know, the, the Game of Thrones version of all the books, you know, if we could get somebody over, you know, Amazon or Netflix or... Uh, HBO yeah, somebody to just say, "Fine, we're gonna we're gonna do the canon, and we'll you yeah, know, we'll do as many years as it takes." And yeah, do the uh, yeah, yeah, if only. <laughs> really yeah. Hope. Oh yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, you've clearly got a lot going on now. I mean, you, you know, we've talked back and forth about scheduling and time and everything else. What 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 all is happening with you, and what what are you looking forward to? Yeah, well, I'm still, I'm still doing. I mean, having moved into what I think they call the world of fine art now, I, I do, I do no book covers. I do very, very little commercial work now. Okay. It's all uh, gallery work. It's paintings to mostly to commission now, um, and and most of it is to do with naval history. Occasionally, I get people wanting me to as it were, do a painting illustrating a Patrick O'Brien scene. That sometimes happens. But normally, uh, normally they want the hard stuff. They want the real naval history. So um, so right at the moment, I'm in the middle of painting a Battle of the Nile, which is the fifth, wow. fifth Battle of the Nile I've painted, which is the Battle of the Nile is a bastard yeah, because, <laughs> uh, because, because it nearly all took place pretty much at anchor, which means you've got to paint... At the moment, I'm painting eight lots of rigging for ships of the line, one after another, which is, and it's quite a big painting as well, so it takes wow. a long time to do. And uh, Trafalgar's, so I've done Trafalgar 15 times now, 14, mm -hmm. 15 times. People mm -hmm. t tend to want the same things, you know. Um, I, my my colleagues in America, it's it's always the Constitution, you know, poor oh, guys. <laughs> 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 I, I dare say there might be a listener or two who would like to reach out and commission you, but if there are people who'd like to get hold of prints, are there prints of 
some of your work? When someplace where people can go online and get hold of those? Oh, sure, indeed. Yeah, one is marine art, and the other is art marine, yeah. and and they supply prints. They also supply. At one time, I used to do a lot of work with uh, Mystic Seaport, right. um, and they had their own print uh, operation, but that's pretty much played down now. And so the the sources that I've just mentioned are also the ones that have Mystic's prints as well. So, Jeff, thank you very, very much for spending time with us. It's been great to have you with us here on The Lubbers Hole. Really, really fascinating to hear about the story of how the art has come to be and your connection to the books and the story. So thank you so much for spending time with us. It's been great to have you with us. No problem. Thanks. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, I just hate that we could not have gone ahead and talked all night with Jeff Hart. Yeah, that for was sure. Fascinating. What a wonderful man. What uh, so kind of him to take that time out with us for there sure. and with all our listeners. Yeah, definitely. So, some some really great new perspectives as well. You know, yes. Talking to somebody who spent time with the author O'Brien, talking to somebody who was part of the, the evolution of these series of novels as great landmarks in late 20th century fiction. It's great, great. And as you say, very, very kind. Jeff, if you listen to this once again, thank you so much for your company. We hope that our paths cross again. So, Mike. I was I was just going to say, too, that, you know, I, I think for me, you know, for Aubrey, it was, you know, listening to Nelson say, pass the salt. For me, <laughs> I'm always going to be thinking about Jeff saying, you know, O'Brien say, could you make the volcano a little more crimson? <laughs> That'll be that line stuck for me for forever. I love that. Absolutely. So, Mike, what are we looking forward to next? What could be coming next for our listeners? Well, you know, Ian, I think we've, you know, we've had so many requests for another Crossing the Line episode. And, you know, we keep getting this and, we, you know, we've done several of them. Ian was so kind and, and some of our great guests were so kind, especially while I was hospitalized. And Ian and I both worked in management for so long. And we thought, you know, perhaps there's some management and leadership lessons in this world of Aubrey and Matron, that we could do a little crossing the line special for you as as a bit of a holiday treat here uh, to you know move us into the new year. So, Mike, what, what do you say to a bit of Patrick O'Brien inspired scholarship? Oh, with all my academic and managerial heart. Mm-hmm. 